So welcome everyone to today's Drill User Group Meetup about agent-based modeling. I'm Stefan Sam, the organizer of the Drill User Group Munich since just before Corona. And I'm very happy this is still going on also after JuliaCon this year. So first talk after JuliaCon um, 2022. And I'm very welcome to um, have George Datzeris today with us. I'm very happy about him joining us. He's going to present us agents.jl, where he happens to be the main maintainer by now. Contributed a lot. So complex systems and programming for complex systems is one of his passions. He started using Julia within his PhDs and um, is now doing his second postdoc in Exeter in the United Kingdom and still using Julia. And yeah, and he started also working on the agents.jl package, which he's now going to present to us. Thank you very much, George, for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to your, to your talk. The stage is yours. Great. Thanks a lot for the invitation and the uh, uh, kind uh, welcome, Stefan. I'm very happy to see that a lot of people have guitars in their background videos. <laughs> I'm a musician myself, so I definitely appreciate that. Uh, so let me share my nice screen over here. Cool. So I uh, no. So what I will do is use a presentation I have given to a group of people that already work in this field called agent-based modeling, and tell them why I think it's a good idea that they should consider Julia in agent-based modeling. I will give the same presentation to you, and but don't worry, the presentation also includes what is agent-based modeling. And in this talk, I will actually skip the the why Julia stuff because I'm sure you know it pretty good. So uh, the way I, I went about it was to start this presentation with uh, uh, some appetizer to wet the tongue. So what you see in front of you is a, is a simulation of a zombie outbreak that happens in Hamburg. I mean, if you are from Hamburg, you know this place. If you're not from Hamburg, you believe me that this is Hamburg. And what happens is you have these things, these purple uh, circles, they are agents, so they are individuals that can act according to to some rules and their own surroundings. And what happens is they all go to, to see a presentation at a specific point in, in Hamburg. So they move around, but at some point, one of the agents turns into zombie and becomes green. And then the simulation shows the zombies that are green that start to chase the humans that are purple. And you see that the humans stop from time to time because they have to rest. I have they have some kind of internal. Uh, they count the amount of kilometers that they travel, and after some amount of kilometers, they have to rest, as most humans typically do. And that's it. So as you can see, this is a simulation that happens on the OpenStreetMap implementation of Hamburg, and this entire simulation takes about a hundred lines of Julia code. It is really simple to set up this complex scenarios with agents.jl. So, okay. So what's agent-based modeling? Um, it is, a a, agent-based modeling is a way to simulate real world systems. And in how it works is that you have some kind of autonomous agents that re react to their environment and interact with other agents given a predefined set of rules. And these rules are formulated based on explicit statements. So these are not mathematical rules like differential equations that tell you all oh, the rate of change of X is that. They are rather they are really statements. For example, oh, if condition X is fulfilled, eh, the agent has to do action, action Y and then perform operation Z. And these models are really useful in several different uh, situations, but specifically in socioeconomic and complexity sciences because First of all, they can capture emergent phenomena that happen only when you have interactions between agents and you cannot see from the individuals themselves. But also because the, this framework of agent-based modeling provides an, a natural description of the system. So your, the code you write is practically the same as the word you would write in your paper that describes your model. And it is also flexible. It is very, very easy to fundamentally change the rules with the simulation, which is something you cannot really do with differential equations. You don't really have such such power or such flexibility. So to 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 make the abstract concrete, I always use the selling segregation model. It's one of my favorite things of all time. 
And it shows that the emergent phenomenon of segregation, that people tend to create neighborhoods with people that are similar to their own selves, which is a phenomenon you see pretty much in every, every major city of our planet. So anyway, what happens is this model shows that segregation can happen even if the agents care that only a few of their neighbors are the same. Because intuitively, you would think that, ah, segregation happens because you prefer most of your neighbors to be the same as you. But this model shows that, in fact, even if you prefer that only a few of your neighbors are the same as you, you still get segregation. So how does this work? Well, the way it happens is that you have some agents and they belong to groups and the groups are the integers so that we are politically correct. We just say that groups one are one, two and three. And they, the agents live in a two-dimensional two grid with integer positions, like these black dots over here. And what happens is that at every step of the simulation, the agents look at their eight closest neighbors on the grid. And oh, let me, okay, eight closest neighbors on the grid. So this is exactly what I'm showing here. If my agent is here in the center, it looks at all positions nearby so that may or may not have agents in the position. Okay. And then what happens is that if at least K of the neighbors of an agent are of the same group, the agent becomes happy and stays where they, they are. But if not, the agent is, is unhappy and moves to a random unoccupied position. And the amazing thing is that this simulation shows segregation already with K equals three. And I have here an interactive simulation that I can run. We will see the code later, don't worry. So this is a, I hope it's visible. I really don't know. Uh, is this visible? Yes, yes you see this? Everything. All right. So what happens here is you have two agents. One is red. Uh, sorry, what? One is orange and one is blue. And I have set up the rules of the game to be exactly what I just described. And now I can click here, step model, and it would run through all the agents, perform the rules of the simulation and update them accordingly. And you see, as I step the model slowly, but surely, the agents completely segregate into a fully blue and fully, uh, what color? Orange neighborhoods. Um, so this is selling segregation model. Another example of a typical agent-based modeling behavior is the flocking or Boyd simulation, which say, shows that birds create flocks without having a direct directive to flock. And the way this works is that birds, well, birds are agents that live in continuous space and they have continuous velocity and orientation. It's not discrete like the grid I showed before. And what each bird wants to do is actually pretty simple. They want to maintain a minimum distance from other birds to avoid collision. They want to fly towards the average position of their neighbors and they want to fly in the average direction of their neighbors. And once you set up a simulation that has these three simple rules, let me run the simulation. Then I forgot to pre-run it. As we are all Julia users, we know that <laughs> compilation takes some time. So let's hope in this example, compilation is fast because I didn't run it beforehand. Big mistake. Ha, thank God. All right. So you see here, the uh, this is the flocking simulation with some random default parameters. And you see what happens here doesn't make much sense. Birds flock, uh, form these circles, which is really not what happens in the real world. But there are some parameters here for the simulation that uh, I can change, and then I click update, and then it becomes even worse than what it was before. But I'm, thankfully, I'm not a zoologist, so I don't really know how birds work. So it's fine if I mess this up. But thankfully, someone who is a zoologist would benefit greatly from such a such a, a setup. So this all comes from the agents.jl package, including this GUI, and it automatically sets the sliders up for you. I will show in a moment. But this is uh, this is kind of what is agent-based modeling. Now, for the people that I gave the presentation before, I also had an introduction to Julia, which I will now skip. Uh, of course, you can see this to see what is my, uh, let's say, major selling point of Julia. This is what I summarize here. Uh, feel free to ask me for the slides if you want them, of course. I'm very happy to share anything and everything. But I skip this for now. Uh, also, I skip this. All right. And now the next step is that uh, I will show you how 
uh, one can create an agent-based modeling in Julia. However, I will not do what the slide says, the, because here it says how to do this in pure Julia. I will show you directly how to do this with agents.jl, which is uh, uh, the, the software. So you can, it is very easy to create agent-based modeling simulations in Julia because it has very high level syntax and it's flexible, but it's still worth it to consider using a, a, an existing software package because it offers many things out of the box. And this is what I saw in this, in this slide. So agents at JL is uh, the Julia package for, for doing this kind of simulations. There are other packages that do similar kind of simulations as well that I mentioned at the end. And it's, let's say, five core pr pr properties that I believe make it much better than everything else open source on the market. It's first that it has a lot of features. It has much, much more features than the competing uh, open source softwares for agent-based modeling, like the one in Python called Mesa or NetLogo. Uh, it is very, very simple to use. And in fact, in my opinion, and actually we have a paper that says this, it is much simpler than the ex than the existing competitors because you will see in the comment the code in a moment. You with 50 lines of code you can do wonders with this uh, package. It is interactive partly because Julia itself is a dynamic language, so you can interact with it. But also, as I already showed, you have this nice interactive GUIs that come out of the box. Uh, it is very very fast, definitely much much faster than the competitors. And uh, we have spent, uh, uh, especially me, we, we have spent so much time optimizing it and rewriting many algorithms in agents.cl so that it is really as fast as we can possibly make it. And the last thing, which comes for free if you're a Julia developer, is that the package is integrated, integrated or composable. So anything from the Julia ecosystem, it integrates very straightforwardly with the software. And this is mainly because of the design of the Julia language, not so much because we are smart. Uh, and there are several examples in the documentation that show how you can couple the differential equation with an agent-based model and many, many more. Also, the main data, the main style of output of the package is a data frame. So if you know, if you do any kind of statistics with data frames, you can immediately analyze your agent-based modeling simulations with the same software. All right. So now we will. Uh, Sorry. Yes, we will go through this example over here, which is the code that simulates the selling model. I will remind you the rules of the selling model, but first tell me if this font size is large enough or not. Everything can be seen, but you can increase it once. All yeah. right. OK, yes. so we load the packages. Ah, remember the rules of the selling model. Agents live in discrete two-dimensional space. At each point of the simulation, an agent looks at the nearby agents. Agents belong, belong in two groups, and the agent counts the neighbors, or how many of its neighbors are of the same group. And if enough neighbors are of the same group, the agent becomes happy. If not, it becomes unhappy and moves to a random location. Importantly, its position of the, in, in this discrete grid can only hold one agent. So the way simulations work in this, in this uh, package is, is very straightforward. The first thing is that you decide what kind of space you have, the space that the agents live in, and the space that fits in, in our case is something that's called grid space single, which is an extremely optimized version of a discrete space that can only hold one agent per position. So we just initialize the space over here, and that's the first the first component we need. The second component we need is to create a, a Julia struct or a Julia type that represents the agents. And the way this happens in agents.jl is with the macro at agent. So this is a macro that takes an existing Julia type. Here, this is grid agent two. Let me just type it quickly so you see what this is. So field names of grid agent two. So this is a Julia type that has two fields, a one field ID and one field position. And what this at agent macro does is inherits these fields from this uh, type and puts them into this new type that we are creating now. So now with this code block, we are creating a new type that has first the fields of the existing type and then the fields that we care about and they are for our simulations. And the reason we do this is because agents need, need to have some mandatory fields 
to interplay with the existing space type. And for the discrete space, these fields are just the ID of the agent and the position. But for other spaces, it is something different. And we've set up this macro to make this process very convenient and very simple because, to be honest, I was a bit um, unhappy with how unintuitive or difficult it is with, with Julia at the moment to inherit fields. Actually, it is impossible because, of course, Julia really pushes for the functional programming, which we also do. But we really believe that for creating the agent types, having a struct is really much more intuitive than having functions. So this is why we wrote this agent macro, which, by the way, took a lot of effort. So if you ever are in the market for creating a macro that inherits um, fields from other types, please go ahead and use the source code. <laughs> it took a bit of effort, unfortunately. Anyway, so now we have this selling agent over here. And if I type field names of this agent, you see that it has four fields, ID, position, group, and happy, whether it's happier. OK. Now, the third step is to create an instance of an ABM. An ABM is an alias for agent-based model. So if agent-based model. So if I get uh, collect the, the documentation of this thing, it tells you that this is the central structure for performing simulations with our package. And it is very simple to create it. Practically, only the only things you need is the agent type that we have already created and the space that we also have already created. But there are many other things that are typically useful in many simulations. I will not go through all of them, but only the two we need here. And the first thing is that we create a properties dictionary. And the properties dictionary is just a global properties that govern the entire simulation. This property here is simply the number of agents we need nearby a given agent for this agent to become happy. And at the moment, this is three out of eight. So an agent looks nearby. If three out of the eight possible neighbors are of the same group, the agent is happy. So this is properties. It only has one property, but that's all we need. The second is a random number generator because to establish reproducibility, you want to be able to give a specific random number generator to the model and reuse it later on. And that's it. So these three, these uh, four lines over here just create the agent based model, but then we have to add agents. And the way this happens with the, there are many ways to do this, of course, but the way I do this here is very simple. First, I loop over all the agents I want to add. I occupy some percentage of the grid here. 80% of the grid is occupied. And first we check, OK, half the agents must be in group one and the other half must be in group two. Then we simply create a new agent here by giving, uh, giving it an ID. You see that all agents have the same position. And the reason this happens is because we add the agents to the model using the function add agent single. And what this function does, it adds this agent to this model in a random position, but ensuring that there is only one agent per position. So this is done automatically by this very nice function. And it's very convenient because it is very often the case that you actually want to do this. And now I have the model over here and I will type it. So the model was returned by this function and we see that it has some basic info that are about the simulation, like what is the type of space, how, how many agents we have, what is the agent type, what are the model properties. Now, the cool thing about this model is that it has a special access syntax. If I access it like an array or a dictionary, it returns to me the agent with the given ID. So model ID gives you the agent uh, of, of that has this ID. The other special syntax is that if you try to get a property of the model here, this property could be we can only be meant to be happy because that's the only property that we have. It returns you the, the property of the dictionary that you gave it. So remember here we we gave it this dictionary and it has this very nice overloading of accessing this uh, type uh, agent based model. All right. So now what we have to do, the fourth step of creating the simulation is to create a stepping function. So this is a normal standard Julia function that takes us in an agent and a model and the model object and just is the rules of what is what each agent does when the simulation starts. So this is extremely simple in our case. Uh, what we have to do is to look at our neighbors and there is a very, very powerful function in agents.jl. Actually, I think this function 
is the most powerful thing in the entire in the entire software. It is not only the fastest function <laughs> compared to other software, but also the most featureful. Uh, it's amazing that this function can do everything <laughs> everything you can imagine. Uh, so what it does, it is takes as an input an agent and the model object, and it returns an iterator over agents that are nearby. So if I type this over here, uh, you will see that it is a that takes a third argument as well, as well, which is a search radius. So this is how far away to search to find neighboring agents, which by default is one. So if to, to give you an example, an A equals nearby agents model one model. So now I will, uh, okay, of course the printing here, it doesn't make any sense because this is a, this is a generator. So <laughs> let me collect the, the answer that makes more sense. Yes, okay. Uh, so what happens here is it just gave me all the agents that are nearby the, the, the agent with ID1. So it does what you expect. So in the agent step function, the first thing we do is we simply count how many of our neighbors is in this, are in the same group. So I hope this is, if, if something I saw is not understandable, please stop me. I'm assuming because you're all Julia programmers, you understand the code, but if not, you have to stop me. I cannot see anyone, nor the chat. There's actually one question in the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, Abel, for, for joining this. Um, so the question is, if I want nearby agents, but not diagonally adjacent, how easy can I do that? Uh, it's very easy because when you create this space over here, there is one more argument, which is the metric that you will use. And by default, it is the Chebyshev metric that includes also diagonals, but you can make it the the Manhattan metric, I think is the the one that is like a like a rhombus instead of a, of a cube. <laughs> so it is as simple as just typing here, uh, uh, metric equals uh, Manhattan, that's it. Awesome, thanks. All right, so I resume. We counted how many are in the nearby, sorry, how many are in the, how many nearby agents are the same group, and then we just compare them. Uh, are they more than what the global parameter is? Then make the agent happy. If not, the agent is unhappy, which means that we have to move the agent to a random unoccupied pos uh, position. And this is very, very conveniently done by this function, move agent single that moves the agent to a random position, but also an unoccupied one. So yeah, so we define this and then we step, we perform one step of the simulation with this function called step model agent step. So what this function did, it went through all agents in the model, activated them once, put, put them all in this agent step function we created and then stopped, that's it. We looped through all the agents and we performed the agent step once. And what is really cool about agents.jl is how unbelievably simple it is to visualize things. So in this, to, to visualize it, what you have to do is define a function that takes as an input an agent and gives you the color or takes as an input an agent and gives you the marker and then it creates a scatter plot of the agents. So this is exactly what I do here. Uh, of course, these visualizations are done with Machia, the best visualization software that the planet has ever seen. And, oops, sorry, give me a second. Yes, okay. So, um, the other thing that is really cool is that if, uh, this, is, this is optional, but if you provide the stepping functions in this ABM plot function, so this is the plotting function, the ABM plot function puts all of these controls for you here for free. So let me comment this out to, 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 to show you what I mean. So without the, AB, uh, the agent step, there is no controls. So it's a static plot, but with the agent step, there are controls. So this is an interactive plot. So I can click here, run model, and the model runs, and you see there are many sliders, and you could even add sliders for the parameters of the model, but I don't care to do this here. That's how inter, uh, visualization works. And the other thing that we are very proud about because it is very, very simple is how data collection works. Because of course, if you are an actual scientist doing this stuff, what you care the most about is to get some data out of this thing and actually analyze them. And the way this works is very simple. Uh, what I have set up here is a data collection that collects the happiness of each individual group specifically. So I would have a column that is the happiness of group one 
and a column that is the happiness of group two. Let me show you the, the results so it makes a bit sense and then I, I will explain what the code means, ADF. So this is what I mean. You have the step, so this is time series. Time goes down and here you have how many people from group one are happy and here is how many people from group two are happy. So this is how you would want the data to analyze them. So the way this works is very simple, is you create a vector of, of tuples. Each tuple is one column of the resulting data frame, and the tuple can have at most three or at least two entries. The first entry is the property that you want to collect, and this could be an actual symbol, which is a field of the agent type, or it could be an arbitrary function. Uh, for example, I could type here a2 a dot post one. Okay, so here in the first row I collect the happiness property of the agents, and then the second entry is how to aggregate it, how to average over all agents. And the way I average here over all agents is I simply count, so I I sum it up. The third entry, which is optional, is a filtering entry and it filters, it only collects data for agents that fulfill the function that you give. And here the function is if the agent's group is one. And you see here on the second line, I make the arbitrary function instead of the happiness property, which is actually just the first coordinate of the agent position. And then I aggregate it using the main function. And this is, uh, ah. I think undeniably the worst thing about the Julia language is that the statistics part is not part of base. I mean, is there a human on this planet that doesn't want the mean function? Come on, please. <laughs> Sorry, that's my one of my typical runs. <laughs> I apologize. Um, okay, so you see what I mean. Of course, the average position of the agents is quite literally the, the average of the grid because agents are uniformly distributed. So that's not very useful now, but it could be. So this is how data collection works. It is spectacularly simple. With literally three lines of code, you can configure any kind of data collection you can imagine. And here I had some benchmarks to show that it is really, really fast. But I hope you can believe me on that one. I don't have to prove it to you because you know Julia, so you know it's fast. OK, but I don't think the performance is actually the biggest benefit of using agents.jl. In my opinion, it is the brain time, the gain in brain time. You have to spend so much less time thinking and writing code if you want to make an ABM with this software. I think this is by far the most important uh, aspect. And this becomes so much more clear when one does, does a, a, a truly complicated simulation. So, uh, oops, one moment. So what I have here are the rules of the game for, a, for, a, for the zombie simulation but I don't want to go through it fully because uh, it will take a bit of time, actually. Let me check what's the time, yes. So what happens over here is within these, um, how much are they? Yeah, like a hundred, uh, where is it? About 150 lines of code, one creates this simulation that I, I showed the video in the beginning. Uh, let me play the video again. I like this video, so I will play it again in case you don't uh, remember it. So this was the video with this zombie simulation. And to do this, as you need about 100 and 150 lines of code because we have all these functions implemented that tell you, ah, how to plan routes in an open street map. Ah, how to travel for three kilometers while going at the maximum allowed speed limit of the city. Ah, how to, to to find nearby agents that you can access within three kilometers of walking distance. All these things are already implemented out of the out of the box practically. So you don't need to spend time thinking about this and you have you spend the time on uh, on composition. You spend your time on doing the actual science instead of making the composition work. You spend the time on deciding the composition. So to show you an example over here, I won't, I won't go through this code because it is a bit too complicated, but a cool thing is that, <clears throat> sorry. So a cool thing is that you can create an open street map space 
exactly like you like you create a discrete space and within this open street map space you can plan a route you have your agent and you have the location that you want your agent to go which is something here that we don't care but you can plan a route and what happens is after you have planned a route for an agent later down the line you can choose the uh, call the function move along route that moves an agent along along this route that you have planned for the for the agent. Uh, so this is the kind of convenience uh, convenience stuff I'm talking about that you can find in agents. Also, also in my to my understanding at least, this open street map space only exists in our Julia software. I I'm not aware of any other open source uh, software general purpose software that has that does this. Okay, uh, quick. Uh, quick discussion on the design. So we have made agents to jail to be a completely modular software, which means that you can pick and choose uh, whatever part of it you want and you combine it whatever other part and everything should just work without you having to worry. Uh, for example, these all these functions that add, move uh, agents, find nearby agents, or plan routes, or find a random position, all of these things are completely independent from which space you have decided you want to use. Uh, the same is for how you get agents, or how you access this property of the agent, or whatever. There is full flexibility on how you schedule agents. There are many predefined ways to schedule agents. For example, you can schedule agents according to the pro property. For example, if the agents have a property that is their weight, you can schedule agents according to their weight, or you can define your own scheduler. And then the simulations are also flexible. Doesn't matter what kind of agent model you have created. The simulation step is always the same. You simulate for n steps or until a given Boolean condition is met. And we have implemented distributed computing and, and sample computing and scanning parameters. Visualization is the same. You define, you decide how things should look like, and then we make it, we make it work internally. Uh, same story with collecting data. And yeah, so this slide shows kind of the the main, let's say, sub modules of the agents.jl package. Um, hmm. I'll go through this. Why not? Because uh, it's it really is a cool example of how easy it is to do things with Julia. So what happens now? What I'm showing is an example that shows how you integrate the agents to JL software with the differential equations uh, software. And at the high level, what happens is that you have some people over here that simulate fishing. So people go and fish, and then they have a specific stock of fish, and then they want to sell this fish. And what happens is that part of this simulation is a differential equation <clears throat> called the logistic equation that you see here on the screen. And when you when you create an agent based model of this simulation, you kind of discretize this in time. But of course, what happens is that if you discretize it in time, there are many ways to do this, either some simpler, some more complicated. And this is actually how you solve the differential equations as well. And it turns out that you could either write your own discretized solution or just call the differential equation solver to solve this part of the problem. So let me reiterate, I have an agent-based model, but part of the model is this differential equation that you see over here. And I could either discretize it myself into discrete time and just manually write the code for it, or call the differential equations library. So I hope you will agree with me that calling the differential equations library is better because you don't reinvent the wheel. So and this is exactly what this uh, documentation page shows us. How to do this? Two ways. The first way to do this is we create an agent-based model and we make the differential equation solver as part of the model property. That's one way we do it. The other way to do this is the other way around. You create a differential equation whose, whose one of the parameters is an agent-based model. And um, I won't go through the code because it will take us some time to explain everything in detail, and I don't think it is necessary at a high level. Uh, I told you what's going on approximately, so you can have a look if you're uh, more interested to see this in detail. 
and integrate. We have many other integration examples, like how you use. How this is a fam the famous example everyone uses uh, measurements.jl to to provide automatic oh, automatic error propagation. Exactly the same thing is happening over here. So we use measurements.jl, and now we have suddenly the data we aggregate have already uncertainty magically by themselves. So all these error bars come from free by just changing all the numbers to measurement numbers and doing nothing else. A really, really spectacular stuff. So this is how uh, how the integrations with other libraries look like. <clears throat> uh, in this slide, I shout out to some other packages that are useful for uh, agent-based modeling that you can have a look. Remember, you can simply have the slides if you want. And when I gave this presentation, I thought it would be nice to have a slide that if people are actually interested, how can they start working on, or not working, but uh, um, being part of this project and in, of Julia in general. So I have here a, a, a bunch of resources about learning Julia or learning agents.jl or learning more about agent-based modeling. This is what the last uh, three links are. <clears throat> And this is when where I closed my my talk in the original case where I presented it to to people that don't know Julia, but now you know Julia, so I'm sure you will have uh, interesting questions that you would like me to answer, or I hope you will. Unless <laughs> I don't know, you'll tell me. But this is the the end of the of the presentation. Thank you very much, George. Yeah, sure, a lot of enjoyed it as well. So we have time for questions. Please feel free to either write in the chat or just raise your voice. I, I myself have one to start with. So you said you also support distributed settings. Mm -hmm. um, is there any difficulty involved then if you go to distributed? Or is, is it yeah, kind of intuitive? You do it just in parallel and then yeah, just runs. Yes, that's actually exactly what you do. So in the code I showed in the example that we use the selling model that I went through the code line by line, <clears throat> I didn't talk about this, but to collect data, you use this function called run. And you give it the model and the stepping functions and how long to run for. If you wanted ensemble simulations, you simply change the run function into ensemble run. And instead of giving it one model, you have to give it as many models as you want to uh, <coughs> in, to, to, to do the ensemble for. So that's the change to go from normal to distributed. And the, of course, the ensemble run function has options for how to parallelize or how to, to distribute uh, yeah, as keyword arguments. Thank you. And then is the, the randomness kind of a problem or? Can I also in an ensemble yeah, manner have control over the randomness? Yeah, you have control. What happens, every model has its own dedicated random number generator, which you access yeah. using this syntax. And all the functions of the library itself that have random aspects use this random number generator. So we try to be as clear as possible about this in the documentation that if you, in your model stepping function, if you have a if you explicitly call rand for whatever reason, don't just call rand, but call rand model don't RNG. So you use the same a thread of random number generation and everything is safe. Thank you. Cool. There's a question by Mo. Are you using agents JL in your research? If so, what kind of models do you simulate? Uh, I'm not using uh, this software in my research yet but I will be in the very, very near future in two different projects. One will be animal movement and epidemic because of uh, spreading of epidemics because of the animal movement. So this is a very, very nice project. I'm super, very much looking forward to that. That will probably also integrate geospatial data like uh, scanning scans of some field and try to see where there are more crops for the sheep to go to and stuff like that. But that's the project, animal movement, so movement of sheep, and the sheep carry some virus, and therefore it is also a, a, a simulation of epidemic spreading. The other project will be more on the social aspect of climate change, so it will be about uh, 
kind of a game theory approach of how humans would respond to to climate change. So try to set up an agent based modeling of 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 humans that are hearing bad news and they deal with them somehow. Uh, so this is very early on. So I'm not sure if I can give you more details about that, but I'm definitely excited about both of them. Sounds like awesome research stuff. <laughs> I'm a bit jealous you can work on such topics. <laughs> <laughs> um, next question. What's the difference between agent-based modeling, like for example, agents of JL and reinforcement learning frameworks, like for example, mm -hmm. Alpha Zero? Oh, we had also rein reinforcement learning.jl uh, last time as a, as a speaker. Is there any overlap or maybe a space for cooperation between those frameworks? Yeah, this is uh, this is a bit tricky. So uh, I I mentioned this here that the problem or the difficulty is that uh, there isn't any overlap because there isn't something to overlap in as far as I understand. So here is my my difficulty because other people have asked the same thing. Re reinforcement learning is just a software to do agent based or similar to agent based modeling simulations. But so is agents.jl, so they kind of do the same thing, but from a different uh, different uh, style, different approach. So I, I thought about it, but I cannot even understand how one could kind of in, incorporate these two softwares, because why would you? If you wanted to go the reinforcement way, you would use this one. If you wanted to go the more traditional route, you would use the other one. So it's not like you can use them at the same time because they do the same thing. I don't, I don't know if I explained this clearly, but I, the, anyway, the lo long story made short is that I thought about it and I don't know how to do this. So if you know, if you have interesting ideas or uh, interesting suggestions, please do post them. I'm very, very happy always to, to increase interoperability of Julia packages and to collaborate. It's just that here I don't know how to do it. Thank you. I think the next question actually also relates to this. How do you do parameter estimation with agents such as AL? Are they di differentiable? So, yeah, like, yeah. can you do learning in agents such as AL? No, no, not in this way that you think. They are not differentiable. No, agent based models are not differentiable. There are some discussions to make them so, but as far as I know, these discussions are only discussions and there is no such thing as a differentiable and agent based model, but you still can optimize parameters, but you just don't go the, the, the differentiation route. For example, this is an integration example that shows how to use blackboxoptim.jl, the Julia package, to optimize parameters of a, of a SIR model, a spreading of COVID-19. And you would you use it the same way you would use blackbox optim. So you define your cost function in, in in this example that I'm showing, the cost function is how many people die, and you want to minimize this function for, for obvious reasons. And, and you just call the black box optimize uh, function. You The cost multi is this function over here that what it does, it creates a model, it runs the model, and then it ca ca calculates, uh, sorry, collects the data of the infected infected fraction, and returns literally the mean uh, of this uh, infected fraction. And what, what happens actually is this example is very, very interesting because on the first time we created this, exa uh, this, uh, this example, what it did was <laughs> uh, it, 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 uh, we had a cost function that was like make the infected fraction something small or whatever. And what it did is it, the way it optimized it, oh, this is so funny. The way it optimized it, it was it made the virus transmissibility as high as possible. So the optimization was to kill everyone as fast as possible. So then we added the second clause to also maximize the number of people that are alive, not only minimize the fraction of infected. But anyway, this is how you would optimize parameters. But as far as I know, they are agent-based models are not differentiable. No. Are there any other questions? Please feel invited to. <clears throat> so I myself am very much interested also in this performance tuning part you've said. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and 
yeah, you did a lot of work there, so I, I just don't know where to start. But have you encountered some, say, on the one hand, low-hanging fruit when you started really making this optimal? Or have there also been some difficulties? Yeah, some things were very easy because they were simply not fast code, but the majority of effort in this library was not from writing good Julia code, but from for from inventing good algorithms. So good ways to, to, to code things so that they are fast. It really was not an issue of, oh, removing uh, allocations because you create a new array every time you create the function. These were the, the easy parts. The hard parts that took a lot, a lot of effort was to really sitting down with pen and paper and thinking, oh, how would I find neighbors in a discrete space in the fastest possible way, for example? So, and this happened over several iterations. I have to admit, we started with a terrible version that used actually a graph. So you, we were using internally light graphs to represent discrete space. Then I went into a version that uh, had boxes and kind of scanned boxes. And then now I, I scrapped that and went into a version that uh, poof, it's an extremely fancy version that creates custom iterators on, oof, on views. Oh man, I don't even remember fully what it does. It's a bit tricky. Some some custom custom iterator that views local neighborhoods of, of an array. So you have an, a location in the array and around it you have this local neighborhood that is either Chebyshev or Manhattan or whatever. And there is an iterator that kind of views this neighborhood as efficiently as possible. Quite a route you've taken there. Yeah, yeah that was uh, that was intense, and this is only one aspect of this library, which is finding neighbors in discrete space. So, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Maybe thank you for joining. Sorry. Yeah. If you're already talking about the neighbors, um, did you also consider nearest neighbors dot JL, or is your use case too particular or easy? No, to you. Uh, the nearest neighbors dot JL doesn't fit here because it is for static trees. But here, in my case, agents move around all the time, so uh, mm. you would need a dynamic st tree structure. But even then, I'm convinced that the method we have would be much faster, because the method we have is kind of a tree structure. It's just that uh, it doesn't divide the space itself. It actually instantaneously creates a box where you want to look. Uh, so I don't think the KD3 approach would be faster. Mm. Okay, thanks. But if you know of a dynamic KDD3 uh, code, let me know, though. I, I would try it out nevertheless. OK, we're still um, not two further questions came in. Um, so we have many agents, all with the same memory structure. Have you looking at a structure of Aries, SOA, versus yeah. AOS to enable, yeah. and I'm lost, SIMD? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a, uh, there is an issue over here. <laughs> Let me find it. Ah, uh, there, we did try, but I was very, very sad to, to learn that it didn't work. Uh, struct, uh, uh, there was this issue, I, I have to find it, that someone did try out using structs of arrays, but, uh, th what turned out to happen is that one of the central most important things in agent-based modeling is that you want to be able to find agents and to do that you need you need a way to find them and the way most people do this including ourselves is with the id the agent id so each agent has a unique identifier and you want to be able to find agents given this id right and unfortunately for us i think what happened is that Iterating through a agents was faster with the struct array, but finding the agent with ID 24 was much slower because you would literally have to scan through the array and find a uh, search to find the ID 24 instead of using the hash map of the dictionary that just gives you the ID 24 agent. So I think this was where the 
uh, main problem was. However, I am kind of convinced that it's worth try, uh, thinking about it more. Uh, so if you are interested in this, there is an issue in, in this in this uh, uh, in the GitHub repository. I just don't find it right now. And there is an ongoing discussion about this. And I'm sure uh, in the future we will make a, a, a version of of an agent based model that is unkillable. So there you would only have agents that cannot be killed. And in this way, you can optimize the, this because you can make an equivalence between the agent ID and the uh, order the agent has on the array, because since agents cannot be removed or added, you will always have the same order. And there it will definitely be much faster to have this uh, struct of, uh, how is it? Array of structs, right? What is what, what was it? I don't remember exactly. Yeah, structs oh, yeah. of errors. Yeah. Ah, yeah, please. I'm done. That's my answer. Um, can you just shortly explain what SIMD stands for? I was lost there. Uh, SIMD is a set of instructions for parallelizing uh, 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 loops. Like, um, there isn't the I, can you tell me the name of who who asked this? Um, it's uh, yeah, it's just a short. <laughs> Have a look into the chat. Um, it was the second last. Anyway, or, so the, maybe, the yeah, the, the reason the user suggested this is because you typically do for x in collection uh, operation x model. Okay, and and what happens is SIMD is as, uh, compiler instructions that parallelize such such operations, make them much faster. But what happens in our case is this X thingy and the collection thingy are not simple because the collection is a dictionary and X is a is a custom struct that the user creates. So typically these specialized instructions don't apply. But what packages like struct of arrays does is make special kind of vectors of structs that you can apply these special operations on. Um, one, one other problem is, however, that this par parallelization and uh, may error in agent-based modeling because you get, uh, you, ha you have a lot of race conditions that you have to be careful about. And typically, you don't want to be careful about an agent-based modeling because you just want to get on with your simulation. But anyway, as I said, this is definitely something to look more in the future. Thank you. So further question, do you plan to use the new graph.jl package? So I think it's because you mentioned you having using like graph. Yeah, the, the code is already ported to graphs months ago. Uh, but the initial version was light graphs because it was three years ago, and there that's when it existed. <clears throat> and this is then you don't use it for the grid space, but you have other spaces which then use the graph structure, or where do you use it? Yeah, there is a graph space. Yeah. It's a space that the location of the space is the same as a node of a of a graph. So you might have any arbitrary real world graphs that you want to put in there, and that's the way. <clears throat> uh, this is useful, for example, if you have if you want to model transportation networks uh, where you have nodes that are representing cities and many agents live in one city and may transfer from one city to the other city. The best way to represent this kind of space is with the graph space. <clears throat> Thank I have another much. question. Perfect. Um, I think you mentioned that you have continuous space, right? Mm -hmm. Do you also have a, well, you don't have continuous time, but do you have variable time steps for like, if there's um, if there's a time gap between two events, so you know the next few steps, the agents aren't going to interact, so you kind of skip forward, like um, with, with kind of uh, variable step differential equations, or is it always the same? time step in your model. It's always the same. However, what you just described is very straightforward to do by yourself. Because in this 
the way it works is you have two stepping functions. I just didn't discuss the second. The second function is a model step that steps the model at the pole. And <clears throat> what you can do is, for example, we have this in the documentation. Actually, this is simpler if I show it to you here uh, on the stepping. <clears throat> You can create custom stepping yourself. Give me a second. My, my vision isn't the best. Give me a second. Yes, advanced stepping. Perfect. <clears throat> so you don't have to look through the agents uh, the way I did it here. This is the simplest way, but you have much more power, for, power as a user. So the way we do it here is you have your own stepping. So you do your own scheduling and you step the, the agents. Then there is some intermediate model action. Then you may reschedule again, and then maybe you will do a special step that only happens once every 100 steps. So you have full flexibility on how you step the model. That's the advantage of allowing the stepping functions to be arbitrary Julia functions that the user creates. So out of the box, what you said doesn't exist, but that's exactly how you would do it. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. I'll um, ask another one if no one else wants to. Um, do you have a favorite user of agents.shell or a, a most most crazy application in terms of maybe performance boundaries being pushed or model sizes or something like that? Uh, hmm. I guess Ali would be the one that pushes the performance to the limit. Um, because he always opens new issues or has new suggestions about how to make the ensemble stuff more <laughs> uh, to add progress bars in the ensemble simulations. And I thought, oh, OK, if you need a progress bar, you probably run it for long. I guess Ali would be the, the one that does the perform the, that pushes the performance to the max. Uh, so favorite use is something I saw in the, in last year's JuliaCon that blew my mind. The, and that I was totally unaware of, that someone used our software to model the spreading of a, of a specific parasite in, in, in coffee trees. I was like, damn, that's awesome because I love coffee <laughs> and this used the software for coffee. So I'm like, that's cool. Uh, yeah, so this is the uh, Julia con from last year that uh, models coffee trees with agents.cl. Maybe you want to check it out. I don't remember the title at the moment, but yeah, that's probably my favorite one. Thank you. We would have time for some more questions, but it's also fine to kind of make it an end here. So I want to thank you again, George. It was a pleasure to have you here today. And also all the questions show all the interest from the participants. <clears throat> so it was an awesome presentation with a lot of fans on stuff. And yeah, I haven't tried it out yet, but I'm looking forward to get my hands on agents.jl as well. Yeah, and thanks. also You're... You're very welcome, is what I was about to say. <laughs> Thank you. And also thank you all for, for all who joined today. So this was really making it um, yeah, across a great meetup to have your participation here, have the questions and the interactivity. Yeah, thank yeah. you for being there. Yeah, thanks a lot for all the questions. I also appreciate it a lot. <laughs>